about first order predicate logic, and I've done an entire series on first order predicate logic, demonstrating every not not every single one, but all of the general sort of introductory um, existential instantiation, existential generalization, universal generalization, universal uh, instantiation, and so on and so on and so on. I've gone through and I've given examples and given um, a lecture series, devoted a whole lecture series to first order uh, <clears throat> predicate logic. So if you want to watch that series, if you haven't seen it yet, you can go back and watch uh, my my uh, predicate uh, logic series. Just click the link where it says here. What we're going to discuss today, what I'm going to discuss today, are three properties of first order predicate logic. Give me a second. <clears throat> three properties of first order predicate logic. So three properties of first order, oh, sorry. I'll just abbreviate it, first order predicate logic, FOPL, first order predicate logic. <clears throat> so three, three properties of first order predicate logic. Now, first thing that we recognize, uh, and this comes from, citation comes from the book, as I said, Artificial Intelligence by uh, Elaine Rich and Kevin Knight. Uh, granted, I know the information in this, not all of it, but some of the information in this is dated. Um, uh, this is 1999. Um, however, much of the logic that's presented is still very, very valid. It's it's relatively undiscovered. No one, you know, people have heard of modal and epistemic modal, maybe less so. People definitely know about symbolic logic. Um, not very many people get into um, non-monotonic and fuzzy logic because of uncertainty. Variability is harder to assess. I'm I'm not saying that people believe that. I'm going to present it so that you understand it. That's that's the whole point. Okay, so the first thing. And this comes from the text, page 179, the book that I just showed you, is a quote. Uh, let's read through the quote. One, it is complete with, right, three properties of first order predicate logic. This first order predicate logic is complete with respect to the domain of interest, right? First order predicate logic is complete with respect to the domain of interest. In other words, all facts, and I should have probably highlighted that, this is a good point, all facts that are necessary to solve the problem are present in the system or can be derived from those that are um, by conventional rules of first order predicate logic. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I went through and I told you, and I have actually provided you in, um, I think, both my predicate logic series and my symbolic logic series, a link to the 19 different rules. So, De Morgan's, Modus Tollens, Modus Polens, um, commutation, addition, blah, 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 blah. Those rules, in combination with a knowledge of how to apply those rules to, as uh, was said here, um, the domain, I can deduce the, the premises, I can deduce conclusions from the premises, right? So I, I have my, my premise, I'm given um, uh, propositions, I deduce conclusions based on the application of these 19 um, rules, right? And I've walked through many, 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 many different and varying degrees of complexity examples throughout my YouTube channel, right? So that's one of the hallmark characteristics of um, first order predicate logic. Um, most important thing, all facts that are necessary to solve the problem are present in the system, right? So I will say it's self, I'm going to summarize that as self-contained, right? It's self-contained, right? Information that I need to arrive at my conclusion is self-contained. It's given to me in the uh, premise itself, as long as I understand the application of the rules to the premise, I am able to derive a conclusion necessarily from the premise, right? So that I have true premises, uh, true conclusion as well. Okay, so... That's fine. Number two, um, it is consistent. Right? It is consistent. First order predicate logic is consistent. Um, insofar as I am talking about the relationship, for example, between the rules and the methodological, the process of deduction, right? Let, let me keep it real simple. Uh, let's say hypothetical syllogism. And we know what that is, if A then B, if B then C, therefore if A then if A then C. Within that, the truth of that is contained, it's consistent, right? It's consistent. It's not only 
just s consistent in sort of the in the uh, in the framework of the language, in the formal logic, it's consistent in a more sort of colloquial sense. It's consistent, conceptually consistent, right? The example that I gave, if it's um, how's it go? If it's raining, I'll bring my umbrella. If I bring my umbrella, I won't get wet. Therefore, if it's raining, I won't get wet. I mean, that just that that makes sense, right? The consistency, the sense that makes the fact that it relates to the world is contingent based on the fixed state of um, the properties, right? So the truth of the truth of any statement remains true unless we transform the nature of the argument, right? It just it it remains consistent. Okay, uh, sort of simple. Again, very very general. I'm not trying to get super deep. I want to keep it uh, very simple. And for those of you who already know how to are learning because of my YouTube videos and others, um, how to solve first order predicate logic problems and sort of the nature of first order predicate logic in each you know each constituent part, which I go into detail on, then this will make more sense in time. So if you don't yet understand it, these videos hopefully will be up for you know, long after I'm dead. Uh, just click the link, watch the videos on first order predicate logic, you'll have a better sense of non-monotonic logic. Though I'm not going to be going into an extremely deep, I mean I'm going to get pretty deep, but I'm not going to go into a very, very technical um, lecture on non-monotonic logic because that's not the intent of this, the series, but I do want to introduce uh, some general concepts. Um, and you know, I'll vibe it and see, you know, how much deeper I should go based on your interest. Okay, so Lastly, number three, the only way it can change, this is a direct quote again, the only way it can change is that new facts, right, the only way that it can change is that new facts can be added as they become available. If these new facts are consistent, consistent with all the other facts that have already been asserted, then nothing will ever be retracted from the set of facts that are known to be true. This property is called um, monotonicity, monotonicity. Right, so monotonicity is the, what does that mean? I mean, just obviously, or, or, or more basically, insofar as I am talking about a set, right, and I want to use the words that they use, the facts are consistent with all the facts that have already been asserted, then nothing will be retracted, yeah, from the set of facts. So insofar I'm talking about um, a set of facts, these set of facts remain consistent really throughout time. Right, the author, and, and not just physical time, but conceptually, right? These sets, these this set of facts remains true, meaning that the truth or falsity of any statement, right? The truth or falsity of any statement within this larger set remains fixed, right? So that when they say retracted, we don't have to say um, that truth and falsity fluctuates, that it was true at a time and then it becomes untrue, or that the truth is, is it can't be assessed in terms of sort of statistical 100% true, right? There's no, there's no possibility within the system to make accommodations for that, right? For, for much more technical reasons, but that's not relevant now, right? So what I want to write in sort of a, sort of a blurb, uh, then nothing will be retracted from this set of facts that are known to be true, this property is called mono, uh, uh, consistent with all the other facts. Um, if these facts are consistent with all the other facts that have already been asserted, how, how would I paraphrase that? Been asserted, then nothing will be retracted. Okay, so um, uh, no need for R E T R A C T I. There's no need for retraction. It's a simple way of saying it, right? There's no need to retract. There's no need for retraction. Why isn't there a need for retraction? Because the um, the facts of a matter remain consistent. There's no flux. That's the perfect way of saying it, right? There's no fluctuation in the um, truthfulness of the facts um, throughout time, right? There's no uncertainty. There's no fluctuation. They remain consistent. Okay. Simple enough. Okay. So, three properties, generally, of first-order predicate logic, and again, as I said, I've gone into far, far more detail, and I'm discussing these and many more in the actual series, so watch the series and you'll get a better idea of predicate logic uh, formally. This is sort of just a very sort of gross generalization. But at the bottom of page 11, then, 
if these three properties are a first order predicate